Miss Chelsea Spagnola. Hello. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. You have got to be in high demand because we have been through a lot in Santa Clarita. We've been through a shooting. We have been through COVID. How are we doing? I think okay. I think okay. better. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, right after everything happened, it was very scary for everybody. Yeah. But I was very impressed with how everyone came together as a community. All the schools bulked up when it came to resources and parents too. Like I think yeah. the the parents of this generation are not as afraid of mental health or intimidated by it. There's not as much stigma. So there was a ton of parents wanting to get their kids into service, either at school or mm -hmm. outside of the schools. That wasn't the response I was expecting. Yeah. But that's good. I'm really proud of our community. Yeah. That's really good news. Yeah. Okay. So you are very well accredited. <laughs> you have been Thank through. <laughs> so I'm looking at like 2000 volunteer hours and constantly training. Yeah. Do you have a specialty that you prefer or something that you're now into? Yeah, so definitely trauma and PTSD. That's what the majority of my training was in as well. Mm -hmm. The 2,000 hours, it's a lot. It doesn't make me special. That's just what we have to do. You have to get 3,000 hours wow. of face-to-face -face therapy and supervision and workshops, all types of stuff before you can sit for your licensing exam. So it's a lot, but I mean, it's a good thing. You want us to be qualified before right. we're sitting down with people. Tell me, like, how do we know when it's time to go to therapy? Anytime. Okay. Anytime. Really? You don't have to be clinical. It doesn't have to be your last resort. Even therapists go to therapy. Really? Yes. Okay. Part of the program I went to at CSUN, they actually make you go to therapy, which is great. Not all programs do that. And I really think they should because you need to know what it's like to be on the other side of the couch. Has every therapist become a therapist because they went to like therapy growing up or, or had this big life event and they had a breakthrough and they want to help other people or something? Like, I don't know. A lot of times, like, yeah. Yeah. Really there's different. the idea of the wounded healer, which explains just that someone who's been through something in their life mm -hmm. and has had their own journey, their own transformation, their own healing, either in therapy or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And they now want to give back. They want to be the healer themselves. Aww. So yeah, that's common, but not, not all the time. Okay. But it's kind of like you said, everyone needs, everyone can go to therapy. So is it like going to the gym? Like it's just something that's good for you. I always kind of thought yeah. like you had to have this like big life event. No. no. And, and that's, I mean, that's a big part of the, the stigma. Part of the assumption is that things have to be really bad. It has to be a last resort. We see that a lot with couples mm -hmm. where when they're starting couples therapy, a lot of times there's already been an ultimatum. Someone has either left or is one foot out the door. And it's like, if you want to save this or if there's any chance, we have to go to therapy. Right. But premarital counseling is great. Counseling at any time is great for anybody. And the example that I like to give, especially when working with kids who are kind of just like plopped in my office and don't know why the hell so I'll explain it to them, though, in trying to relate it to other professionals they maybe have seen. So I'll ask, OK, if you were to have a really bad toothache and your mouth was hurting and you told your mom your tooth's bugging you, where do you think your mom would take you? And they'd say the dentist. Yeah. Right. Okay. If you fall down and you, you scuff up your knee and it's bleeding and you think you might need stitches, where's your mom or dad going to take you? The doctor. The doctor. Okay. So where do you go if you're feeling really sad or you're feeling really nervous? You're worried about taking tests or you're having a hard time making friends. Oh my gosh. So kind of looking at That's looking so at it as like a feelings doctor yeah. and explaining it in that way so that it's in an age appropriate appropriate sense for them to understand, but also totally normalizing it. Like you wouldn't think twice about going to the dentist or going to the doctor and right. it should be the same way with therapy and, and not just for kids, but for anybody. And Wait, so, have you ever had a kid just come in and like sit there and just stare at you and be silent and like oh, I'm not going to talk? Uh, like a maybe half of those 2000 hours no that was way. yeah i was working at a community mental health agency in palmdale a lot of the clients were kids and teens a lot of them were mandated to be there because their family had an open case with child protective services they were kind of just told by a stranger that came in their house you need therapy you have an appointment with this lady in this place at this time and it was some of my most challenging work but definitely where I learned the most and some of the most amazing breakthrough cases and clients that I've ever had. And there's so many to this day that I still think about all the time. 
because there's real connections and real relationships. Like we went through some shit together yeah. where it would, it, for some of them, it was like months of them not talking. They'd have this wall. Wow. They don't trust anyone. They've been through a lot of trauma. A lot of times there was very obvious like racial, cultural differences between the two of us. So to be able to stick it out with each other, to finally find a way to relate to them, to get through to them, to gain trust, mm -hmm. and then see their transformation was amazing. But at times it was also very sad because a lot of those kids were in foster care. So we'd be doing really great work, making progress, and then all of a sudden they're gone because oh. something happened and now they're in a different placement. So there's a few kids, like just having this conversation now, like I feel myself getting emotional because I'm like, oh, I wonder where he is or I wonder how she's doing because yeah. they're real connections that, you know, you can't help but continue you, to think about them and care yeah, about them. Literally change people's lives, like for the better. That's so awesome. Did you always Thank know you. you wanted to do something like this, like this impactful? I always knew I wanted to be in a helping profession, okay. but funny enough, this was actually like, Plan C. I think it was always plan A, but when I was younger, I was like, I don't want to go to that much school. Like that's a <laughs> yeah. lot of school and I don't want to write a thesis and do all the things. That's too much. Like I just want to do a little college and then like be done and make money and have the jobs. But then I, I talked to a family friend and she told me about marriage and family therapy and I looked into it and the degrees that I already had and was working on were all the prerequisites I needed. So I knocked them out within a semester at like four like different colleges, just made it happen. And I applied and I got in and I'm 100% confident like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. That's awesome. Yeah. What would you say to someone that is considering going into taking this path of family marriage therapy? Would you tell them it's going to be a lot of work, but go for it or stop, do something else, what would you I say? I would definitely say go for it, but it is a lot of work and it's one of the only professions, at least that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. where you have to grow as an individual if you wanna be successful. Like you, you can only take your clients as far as you've gone yourself. You wow. can only be as helpful to others as you are to yourself, so that there's so much growing that happens in your master's program. I think that's also part of why a lot of programs want you to do your own therapy, mm -hmm. not only because there's lots to talk about with the school stress, but <laughs> you you cannot help but be in the room with clients and have your own stuff come up, your own unhealed wounds, your own inner child stuff, your own trauma. You're always going to have your own bias and perspectives. You can't help but be present and be human. So you have to make sure you're taking care of yourself through that. Otherwise, you could probably seriously mess some people up right. if your way of guiding them and supporting them is coming from your own stuff, your own place. I like how self-aware you are of that too. And it sounds like you really put that into practice for yourself. I've never heard that you can only take your clients so like as far as you've gone, mm -hmm. like you're willing to go. Like, it's a continuous journey for the professional as well. You said a buzzword, it's really big right now, inner child work. Yeah. What is that? So we uh, we all have an inner child. It's younger versions of ourselves. Usually when that's talked about or when it comes up, it's parts of ourselves that aren't healed, parts of ourselves that might be stuck in some place or some phase in life. So doing that work is kind of acknowledging who that, like, so for me, who that little girl inside of me is, mm -hmm. what she's experienced, what she's been through. And while we can't go back and rewrite history, right. there's a lot of healing that our present adult self can do for that inner child. We can tell her the things that she didn't hear that she needed to hear. We mm -hmm. could give her the support that she didn't have that she needed. So it's a lot of what I do in EMDR, which mm -hmm. is kind of like the... The bulk of my practice right now, okay. which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. That's a whole mouthful. Whoa. Yeah, that so, is definitely a mouthful. <laughs> so Can you say it a little slower? Hold yeah, on. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Wait, walk me That's through That's a this. real word. What? <laughs> what is this? Ha have you heard anything about it at all? I've heard the acronym, but I've not heard okay. it like spelled out like that. Yeah. So it's a type of therapy that uses rapid eye movement to 
process. So are you going to do some with me right now? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it can it was developed for trauma and PTSD initially, but it's been applied to all types of things. Is this OCD, the thing I've heard that's kind of like a hypnotizing, but like a low key version of that? And probably it, okay. I always say to people, especially if I'm explaining it to the first time to like a, a current or potential client, mm -hmm. I'm like, this is going to sound really weird. This is going to sound like very witchy and woo woo. Yeah. It's not hypnotherapy, I promise. But it, it does use rapid eye movement, uh, similar to what's happening when we're in REM sleep or a dream state of sleep mm -hmm. to process materials. So uh, I just keep thinking like this is your party trick. Right? <laughs> you probably like do this on people. <laughs> no. Oh, no. OK, hold on. In therapy, you're awake and conscious. How yes. is this? So you're, you're practicing having to hold dual attention. So the way that I practice EMDR is I use a light bar. Traditionally, you're just using your hand to go back and forth like this. You'd be following my, my finger with your eyes. It's like a field sobriety test. If you get pulled over by the cops, follow my pen with your eyes. Not okay. Your head. But I use a light bar for that to, to get the back and forth eye movement. So you're having to keep focus on the light. You're having to follow it. But we're also focusing on other material. So it could be a thought, an emotion, a body sensation, an image. You are forced to be present and in the moment. And this is something that helps trauma survivors feel a lot more comfortable doing trauma therapy because there's hardly any risk for getting pulled into like a flashback or an intrusive memory, something like that, mm -hmm. because you're forced to be here. If your eyes are having to follow the light, you might be thinking about the memory, thinking about the bad thing that happened, you're reprocessing it, but you're not going to get pulled back into that to where you feel like you are at that time again and you're going through that experience again. Is this something new or has this always been around? It's been around since like the early 90s. It's definitely gained more momentum. Yeah. I personally haven't seen it, but I've heard from other people that it's in like a ton of shows and movies. So I guess it could be a little bit trendy. Okay. I don't know if that's like a thing for therapy, like types of therapy being trendy. Well, I am hearing that but, a little bit more and the EMDR and then the inner child stuff. Yeah. And it could just be because we're on social media and plugged in and we have access to hear more things. But yeah, I hear those words mm -hmm. a lot more mm -hmm. of people working on their inner child. So you can you can use EMDR for past stuff from childhood, mm -hmm. but it's great because you could also apply it to present issues and even future issues that might be bringing some anxiety or if there's something that you experienced in the past and you can anticipate facing a trigger that might bring all that stuff back up again in the next month or the next year. So with that like three pronged approach, you're able to not only get through stuff from the past, you're mm -hmm. able to feel better in the present when stuff comes up and feel a little bit more prepared for the future too. Wow. Okay. So my whole brand is community. Community is difficult. It's yeah. hard to be in relationship with people everything I've read is like, it's important to work through things with friends. Mm -hmm. But if someone's unhealthy, it's hard, but we have to try to not absorb it okay. like a sponge to be able to know what is your stuff and what's my stuff. Okay. And a lot of times when when clients will come to me with relational issues, I'll kind of stop them and ask, is this a them problem? Or is this a you problem? And when we really flesh it out, a lot of times it is a them problem. It's the other person that's either displacing emotion, projecting onto them, and they are absorbing it for whatever reason. If it's guilt, if it's shame, if it's just the dynamic of the relationship. But to know, like, what's yours to hold and what's not. Just because someone says something really mean and nasty to you doesn't mean that it's true. Even if we know, like, that's, that's not okay that they said that, to be able to try to understand, have a little empathy and compassion for them too. Like, where is that coming from? Why might they be saying that? Is that speaking to a part of them that's unhealed, that needs mm -hmm. a little bit of work to know, like, that has nothing to do with me. I didn't say anything wrong. I didn't do anything hurtful. Like, that's them and their own stuff. Okay. Because a lot of time, a lot of times people won't take responsibility and accountability themselves. We can't wait around for them to do that, to say, oh, my bad, I shouldn't have said that. That was rude. I'm sorry. That was inappropriate. A lot of people have a hard time apologizing. So if you're able to say, okay, that sucks, that hurt. I need to acknowledge what I'm feeling. I need to take care of myself. But I also know like that, that's on you. That's your own stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece is just having good boundaries, boundaries with ourselves, boundaries with other people. If 
There are friendships, relationships. It doesn't matter if it's family. If they're no longer serving you, if they're causing more harm than good, then Mm -hmm. you need boundaries. You need to figure out how close you want to be with that person, how often you want to see them, talk to them, which parts of you that you want to share with them. Mm -hmm. Because if there's not a sense of trust and safety in any relationship, it's just not going to feel good. Right. No, that's so good. That's good. Really good advice. Is it our job to point those things out in other people for them? A lot of it's probably going to depend on that specific relationship and how close you are with that person, how safe you feel with them, how much you trust them and vice versa. Okay. Because you also want to think, is this person even going to receive this? Are they ready to hear this? A lot of times, probably not. If people are just being very hurtful in that way, like I I like to think most people mean well and want to do well. So when stuff like that happens, we can assume a lot of times people just don't have a lot of conscious awareness that what they're saying is offensive or hurting the other person. But it's not our job to be but like, it's not your job this to is wrong with you, this is wrong with no. you. This is if you want to, fine. <laughs> no, it that's... might not be received well. Yeah. It it might also. But you got, you got to decide like what's, what's best for you because mm-hmm. sometimes that can lead to more hurt mm-hmm. if then the person is lashing out even more and attacking even more. But other times it can lead to that person gaining insight and more understanding it can it can transform your relationship with them so it just depends and i think at any time we're uh, you know confronting someone about something that we're not happy about or we would like to see change we have to be very aware of our timing of our tone Mm -hmm. our body language we don't want to just like come out with it because people can naturally be very defensive especially if they're caught off guard so it's just always being mindful of what you're saying and how you're saying it. How you're saying it is almost more important than like the words that you're actually saying. Wow, that's so true with having kids. You know, it's easy to teach your kids, like when you point the finger, there's three fingers pointing back at you. But then as an adult, it like never ends. Friendships are difficult. There's something else going on that's really big, which is suicide, suicide Mm -hmm. ideation. Our culture's talking about it a lot more. That's great. We have people talking about it. When someone comes to us and says these things, How do we like walk through that with someone? As casually as possible. Okay. And I know that there's nothing casual about that situation if you find yourself in it or someone you love in it. Mm -hmm. But being very guarded and scared and apprehensive is a lot of times what makes people not ask. Especially as a parent, you could be afraid that I'm gonna plant a seed in their head. What if they don't what if they've never thought about suicide and now I'm saying the S word and now they're gonna think about it and they're gonna go do it. Mm-hmm. Chances are if you think someone is struggling, they are probably struggling because mm-hmm. typically we struggle so much in silence or on our own in our own ways that if it's to the point that it's becoming noticeable and that could be coming out in behaviors it could be isolating withdrawing changes in eating sleeping not leaving the house as much more promiscuous behavior for anyone not just not just kids and teens okay that there there could be something going on so just asking have you had thoughts of suicide that's it Okay, and then you like, don't want to like yes, beat around like, the bush. Then and what be do like, I do? Hey, so I've noticed that like this is going on. Like, yeah. are you okay? Like, are you struggling? Like, it's not like that's bad to say. Okay, but just get to the point. Okay, don't beat around the bush. Be direct. I had a professor in grad school that would say you need to talk about it like you're asking someone what they had for lunch today. Really, just very very casual. Yeah. And then is the next follow up step to encourage them to like call a counselor or. And then, okay, what about that point where you, like, check in with them? Like, is it – how do you even do that? I encourage you to get therapy. You're like, yes, I'm going to go get – I have an appointment on the books. Okay, you go get therapy. Now what? Like, do I just – the ball's in your court? Like, how do we – how do I follow you through that? Because I care about you. I'm a friend. Right. But I don't know what to do. It makes me uncomfortable kind of. And you don't have to know what to do. Oh. You don't have to know what to do. Okay. Even just asking, like if Mm -hmm. if you ask the question or your friend just shares with you, you know, I'm I'm struggling, I'm going through a hard time, I've had thoughts of suicide or whatever else is going on with them. Or depression or anything, Anything. anxiety, uh, eating disorder. Just asking them, how can I help you? Okay. What do you need? 
because so often we will go into panic mode. We'll go into fix it mode. Right. Okay. We need to get you outside. You need to go to the gym. We need to have a girl's night. We need to get you a therapy. I'm going to send you positive quotes every day. Like those are all probably good things. Like if we're talking about like self-care in general, but, and maybe you can relate as a mom, no one likes unsolicited advice. And if you're like, you should do this, you should do that. Like you're not the expert in their life. They are the expert in their life. And Mm -hmm. if you make a recommendation and again, coming from a good place, this is what I'm talking about earlier. We could mean well, but it doesn't always land well. It doesn't always come out well. If you give a suggestion or advise them to do something that they've already done and hasn't helped, that can just feel like, okay, this, why did I even, why did I even open up, you know, or you're just telling me to do all of these things. So not putting that pressure on yourself to know the answers, to have like resources you could pull out and like have ready to go. What do you need? How can I best support you? Okay. And not only does that allow them to reflect a little bit about what they're feeling, what they're needing, but that hopefully gives you something very tangible to do. If that friend says, just check in with me every so often, or let's go out this weekend. Can you meet up? Can I call you? whatever it is that they're able to tell you what they need. And that gives you the opportunity to say, okay, I got you. I can do that. I can help you with that. Or if you can't, which is also okay, let me help you find someone that can. Mm. And if that's therapy or if it's, you know, encouraging them to talk to their partner about what's going on, whatever the situation is, but finding out from them what they need and then having that kind of lead your plan. Of course, it's always great to have resources, to know the hotlines, the text lines, to know a therapist or connect them to a school counselor if it's a kiddo. Mm -hmm. It's good to have that, but that doesn't always need to be our first step unless it's someone that's like in imminent danger, like you really feel they're a threat to themselves right now. Okay, and how do we know that we just – it's – We have to go on our gut feeling. Continuing to talk about it casually. So if I noticed something was up with you, you've been, you know, canceling plans, you're not wanting to go out, you're missing work, you're whatever. If I were to ask you, are you having thoughts of suicide? And you tell me yes. You'd also want to ask more follow-up questions. And this is where it's kind of like, again, you're not expected to know this. This is the stuff we do. Got it. But okay, well, are those just thoughts? Are they passing? Are they here and there when you're stressed? Are they like all the time? So stick to like open-ended questions where we're just asking them. Yeah. Okay. Because there's a very big difference between someone who has thoughts like, God, my life sucks. Like I'm over this. I just wish I didn't have to deal with this. Or I wish something would happen to just take me out. I'm done. I can't handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. That is very different than someone who has those thoughts has a plan to hurt or kill themselves, has a means to that plan, and is like, I'm going to do it tomorrow. So that's like the difference that's between true. imminent or true. not. Okay. Because you could just have passive thoughts of suicide. They're there. They're obviously still a concern and need to be addressed. We need to get you support. But that's not an imminent threat as compared to someone who's like, I'm having these thoughts. This is what I want to do, how I want to do it, and when I want to do right, it. It's right. It's very different. I've heard that before, too. You're so right. Like, when they have a plan, then you're just kind of like, okay, This is like serious. Mm -hmm. Got it. So what about this ADHD? You hear it all the time. Like we're distracted too much or we have too many things on our plate. We just toss this phrase around like, oh, I have ADHD. Is that a bad thing that we're doing this? Mm -mm. No, I hate that. You do? Yeah, it's it's that. It's also like, oh, you're being so bipolar right now. Or maybe I've noticed this like, you know, more recently in life, being married, having kids, like, oh, they're such a narcissist. Like, yeah, sure, there, are, word there are people out there that have yeah. bipolar, that are have narcissistic personality disorder, have HD, but it's such a label that's put on people. And not only is that very hurtful to people who do have those diagnoses and are living with them and coping with them, but I think it also contributes to these things being overdiagnosed, especially if we're talking about ADHD. It's so overdiagnosed in kids. In the the DSM, which is like our therapist Bible for diagnosing, you have to check all of the boxes. If you don't check one of those boxes, you do not meet the criteria for that diagnosis. And it's very specific as for any diagnosis. But it's so overused. And I think a lot of times, especially if we're like self-diagnosing, like Mm -hmm. if, if we're like, okay, I can't get anything done. I start something and I can't finish it. I'm scatterbrained. I'm all over the place. I'm like impulsive. Those can absolutely be signs of ADHD. 
But those can also be signs of depression, of anxiety, of trauma and PTSD, of Mm. so many other things. So for me personally, as a trauma therapist, I'm always looking for that. Was there anything at any point that was traumatic for this client? Okay. And if that trauma never happened, would we still be seeing these symptoms? Right. And if there is a trauma, I'm always going to err on the side of diagnosing PTSD or another trauma disorder before ADHD. So if we can treat the trauma, address it, if that's better, and we're still seeing some of these things, okay, maybe we this is true ADHD, but it can present, those symptoms, those behaviors can present mm-hmm. as ADHD, be, but be something so different. And if you're not treating what's really going on, the root cause, then you're kind of just putting a, brand, a Band-Aid on a broken bone. Like it's not going to be as effective. And especially now as a mom, I think burnout and just being overstimulated and understimulated and exhausted, like we would all be diagnosed with ADHD if it was if it was like that, because we probably are scatterbrained. You can put in a load of laundry and then forget it because you're changing a diaper and making dinner and answering the phone and your dog's barking too loud and the TV's blasting right. the same episode of Coco Melon. Like so <laughs> yeah. we can all start to feel that way. But chances are it's something else. Wow. OK, just a couple more questions because I want to respect your time too. social media. When it comes to just being plugged into our phone, the device, what is that doing to our children? Are they the first generation that's getting the Band-Aid ripped off of them, so to speak? Because it doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon. A lot of times we're doing we're doing really impactful, meaningful work from our phones. Sometimes we're just numbing out and scrolling. But should we be feeling guilty about it? When is too much? I mean, just as curious. a parent, maybe... I mean, obviously trying to be mindful, limit that, trying to be present as much as possible when we're with our kids, but we're human too. Sometimes you have to answer the call, the call. you have to do work. Sometimes you're just, again, overstimulated or understimulated and you're like, I need to just veg out for a second. Right. So with anything, we can always have too much of a good thing. So it's looking at why am I, why am I engaging in this? Mm-hmm. What is it that I'm feeling? Where am I at right now? What kind of headspace am I in? That's making me want to scroll. That's making me want to check my phone. As far as like issues with that or issues with social media with little kids, younger kids, like elementary school age, I feel like you're seeing an impact in that they don't have the same ability to tolerate boredom mm-hmm. as we did in, in generations before us because you have a tablet, you have a phone, you have a TV going, all of this stuff that they don't have to just like sit there and figure out what to do. And with that, it can impact their imagination, playing and so much of how kids process and deal with their own life Mm -hmm. and their own stressors is through play. So I think it's also teaching kids at a very early age to numb out in the same that we do it. Like I'm guilty. I'll be in bed scrolling and doing the whole thing you know but I think because they have all of those devices too it it's making it hard for them to just tolerate being bored and like have to like go outside and make up a game or like go play with sticks and leaves and like go be a kid go do kid things yeah you know I just had a huge epiphany I think I am on my phone even if it's work a lot of times like work is easier and has always been a little bit easier than parenting yeah. All these unknowns, there's a different capacity of energy. So I think you're right. Like we do still have to be mindful of our phone, but then also mindful of how much they're yeah. on electronics too. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, re- I relate to that completely because since I was just recently out of work for mm-hmm. four months with both pregnancies, so I've, I've spent almost a year out of work in the last two years. That time being at home, as much as I love it and I love my kids, and I shouldn't even have to like say this first before saying what I'm going to say because right. it's okay. Right. Like it is hard to be at home. It, I could never be a stay at home mom. As much as I love my kids, I can't do that every day. Like it's like I, I said before, it's so overstimulating, but so understimulating. And my my profession and what I do, it's such a big part of my identity. It gives me so much meaning and purpose that the times that I haven't had that, right. it's so easy for me to spiral into that place of like, who am I? What am I? So yeah. I I notice, especially now that I'm, I'm back to work the last couple of months and I am trying to 
you know, take a different approach with my social media and all of that. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to spend more time doing work things when I'm with my kids. Part of it is like a a stress thing of like, I have so many things I need to do. I need to stay on it. But also like I'm needing to be stimulated. I'm, I'm needing to to reach that that part of myself that is more than just a mom because being on leave for four months I'm like what am I besides a mom this is all I do it's the same thing every day so I think that's part of it for us too or maybe part of what you were alluding to yeah no definitely we have these different parts of our identity identity, and we need to nurture all of them right right but what a good reminder with finding that time to be focused and present with our children they mm-hmm. are such special spiritual creatures, yeah. like they're their own person and they have their own light in them. And I love them. And I do wonder if I'm, I mean, I know I'm going to resent not having spent more time, but I do love that technology has allowed me to find this creative part of myself too yeah. and creating maybe social media things to promote what I'm doing or it is an outlet in and of itself, but I mm-hmm. guess the boundary thing is what you're really reminding me of. It's like, yeah. I almost need that like phone basket, like yeah. <laughs> put your phone in there. Well, just communicating it to your kids too, because you're also modeling for them how to run a business, how to be successful, how to make meaningful relationships, how to network and access your community. You're teaching them all of these things through the work that you do. I never realized how hard it is <laughs> to play like Barbies. Yes. I'm like, I am not a Barbie person. Like Barbie went to like the mall and then that's it. (laughs) Yeah. But you bring up a good point that it is hard. You love your kids. You want to play with your kids. That doesn't mean it's always fun. Like sometimes it's really boring. Sometimes it's really mind numbing. Sometimes you don't want to play Barbies and that's okay. Like either because you have a lot on your mind, you have stuff to do or like Barbies is just boring. Yeah. That's okay. We don't have to feel bad about that. Mm. Can we still play Barbies with our kids? Yeah. Like, we have to do things we don't always want to do, just like they do, too. Like I was telling you earlier, my kid did not want to get in the car seat today. He had to get in the car seat. We got him in the car seat even though he didn't want to. So, again, you're always modeling. You're always teaching them, Okay, you know, through how you're responding to things. Oh, look at you. You make me feel so good. I'm going to walk out of here with a pep in my step. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. If somebody heard something that they like or they're like, hey, it's not that bad after all. Chelsea seems kind of cool. I'd walk into therapy to go see her. Where can people find you? Instagram and Facebook at SCVMFT. And then you'll find the link there for my website. There's a contact form. Yeah, awesome. that's probably the best. So do they too. come, like if someone's coming for the first time, would they just interview you? Would they, it's not like I'm signing a deal. I would have to be stuck with you for the rest of the no, year. Okay. No, it's, and that's super important. I mean, in finding a therapist in general, you want to take the approach of like dating around a little bit if you okay. need to before getting married, so to speak. Okay. The okay. first therapist you see might not be a good fit and that's okay. You want it to be someone you can, you know, build a sense of safety and trust with. But I do offer free consultation. Jeez. So either a call, email, text, whatever. We could set that up. It's usually just 10 to 15 minutes to kind of get a sense of what's going on, what you're looking for, but to really determine if we would be a good fit to work together. So that's always available. And then if for whatever reason, I'm not a good fit for a client, I'm always happy to help people out with resources too. If they just need help navigating the mental health system and finding a provider or any other kind of service. Really? I'm I'm always happy to do that. So people are are welcome to reach That's out for that support. That's priceless. That's so too. huge. Yeah. Thank you. Of and if, I'm sure if we don't need services today, we'll need them in the future for someone we love. And again, it's always a good time for therapy. Okay. Anyone can benefit from therapy. Even therapists go to therapy. <laughs> Thank you for normalizing therapy today. Absolutely. I'm so thankful you're part of Santa Clarita and our community and we have you as a resource. So. Thank you.